Hi, I'm Michael Bradshaw, Vice President of Canem Collision and current board member of the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. Today, we're here to talk to you a little bit about MIG welders, what's important when selecting a MIG welder, and also some of the important processes that you need to follow as a shop when you're performing MIG welds. So to tell us a little more about the types of MIG welders available for shops, we're going to let Toby explain that to us. We have a either 110 or 220, uh, depending on the application. The 110 welders have uh, some restrictions, uh, maximum wire size that you can use on this this particular machine is 030 wire. When you have to do any heavy welding, like on a Ford F-150 truck on a metal frame, they require an 035 weld, uh, 035 wire. Uh, that would require a 220 volt machine. If you're doing aluminum, you're going to need a pulse welder, and these come only in 220 volts. If you're doing MIG weld brazing, again, you would need a pulse welder. Again, you'd have to have 220 volt machines where the 110 would not work. And with, with all the different welders, with the 110 versus 220 pulse, non-pulse, one of the biggest things the shop's probably going to want to consider is maybe what the manufacturer requirements are and what type of vehicles they're going to be working on with these welders. Is that That's you correct, agree, Toby? Yeah, uh, you, if you are on some sort of program uh, from a manufacturer, they might have specifications for a specific type of welder that they want to use, or they might just give you generic specific uh, specifications and that you would have to follow those specifications to buy that machine. So, so when a manufacturer is specifying a particular welder or brand, be very well aware of that. Uh, another manufacturer may say a specification and you're going to purchase a welder based on just a spec, but it will not meet the other manufacturer's requirement. So please do your homework before you buy a unit so you don't end up duplicating a piece of equipment. With all the different welders that are out there, it's kind of impossible not to duplicate some sort of equipment. I mean, as far as a welder goes, there's not really a one-size-fits-all for, for every solution or every vehicle manufacturer that's out there. As Toby was saying with the 110, if you're going to be doing any of the, the full heavy frame welding where you need a 3.5 wire, the, the 110 simply not going to be able to, to do it. So uh, what, what we see in many instances is several welders needing to be available at the shop level to, to do all the repairs necessary. There are some units on the market today that can either be used 110 and they have an adapter and then you go to 220. So that might fit your application. Another way of looking around some of these programs having multiple welders is that a lot of the manufacturers are now having two and three uh, guns on them and they will switch between big well brazing, aluminum and steel. So that might be a way of going. They have to start looking at costs. The 110s are a little bit cheaper, a lot cheaper than these multiple head guns. Um, so take a look at all of the factors when you want to uh, make that investment into a welder. All right, so we've got cost is certainly a factor. Another factor obviously is what type of cars you're going to be working on. But a, a factor for a lot of people that I think is often overlooked would be uh, power availability. You know, does that shop have 220 capabilities to run some of these bigger welders or, or, or are they limited to a 110 volt capability and, and that's simply all, all they have access to? Well, let's talk about, everyone thinks 110. Uh, these machines here work on 110 and if you don't have enough voltage, these machines won't strike an arc. So uh, power in your facility becomes very critical. A number of times uh, with these new, multi, these new welders that are coming on the market that require 35, 40 amp service, uh, you might have to rewire your facility. Um, it's something that you need to take a look at as cost of buying that piece of equipment. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen with uh, electricity, uh, even with the 110, it was amperage might have been 30 amps, which means it was an outlet that was 110 volt, but could have nothing else on it. There can't be a light, there can't be an extension cord. It's just an outlet that you're using the voltage from. We also see on the uh, three phase 220 volt welders, the wire size in the building going to the outlet is critical. 
You can't have a small thin wire in your conduit going to your outlet and then expect it to put out enough amps to run a welder. So it's critical to look at the spec and you need the proper power to operate the welder or you'll damage the welder or it won't perform properly. And as Toby was saying with the new transformers in the welders that'll handle different voltage, that is the newest of technology that a welder can work on 480 volts, it could work on 220 volts, it could work on 200 volts, and without you really changing anything, but again, that's in the specification of the welder. You know, Dave, I'm glad you mentioned the, the wire size and, and what that outlet has to have available at the outlet itself. A lot of times what you've seen, I think all of us have seen when, you, when you're at the shop level, that outlet may be fine, but now there's an extension cord plugged into it and they're running a, a welder 30 feet away from, from the actual outlet. And with that amperage drop, it may be fine at the outlet, but at the welder, at the point of contact, it, it may not have enough amperage to actually function properly. Well, and I think it's important for people to, to know and, and understand, you know, just because you can plug the welder in or you plug it into a drop cord and it works and it welds doesn't necessarily mean you have the correct power or it's working properly. Um, the issue that you're going to run into, and in a, in a lot of the, the times, the reason these manufacturers specify 220 volt welders as opposed to 110 is because in situations where you don't have enough power with the, with the 110 because of the machine limitations or simply because of your power limitations, you're not going to make proper penetration when you're making the weld, which is a, a really big issue. So while it may look good on the outside where you've, you've made the weld and you've created the puddle and the weld looks good, has it penetrated that, that second, third layer properly and, and you know that in and of itself is, is a huge issue. You know I, I think exactly with what Michael was, was saying as far as what that weld looks like I think that is, is a testament to the importance of being able to set the welder up and do your practice welds and destructive tests to make sure that the welder is functioning properly before you start to weld on a, on a vehicle. And but how would a guy practice? So. You say do your practice welds and your destructive tests. What does that mean? Toby, what, what does that mean? Well, I would take some of the metal that was coming off the car and set it up to look for penetration, possibly do a destructive test on it, uh, see if there is enough penetration. And that's where the biggest problem is, is penetration into the uh, base metal. What does that mean, though, a destructive test? What would you do? Uh, easiest thing it would be to tear it apart and see how much tear out is that you have coming out of it. And again, um, there, there are some manufacturers that that actually within the, um, their repair manuals will actually give you specifications of the tear out. The tear out has to measure a, a, a certain, certain distance or, or, or length um, in order for that to be what they would consider a proper weld. Well then again, you also have to look at what you're welding. I mean, if you're using MIG weld brazing, it's not gonna be the same type of uh, destructive test as if you're uh, MIG weld steel. And then aluminum is a whole another ball game. So, you know, there's, it's all about education and training. Yep. Well, and the, and the thing is, the, the important aspect of setting up and testing the welder is, a lot of times now within the industry, we have guys that roll the welder over to the vehicle, start making a couple welds, and like, oh, it's, it's welding cold, and then they'll crank it up, weld a couple more welds, oh, it's welding hot, and then they'll, they'll dial it in where it needs to be, but they've already welded, you know, half the vehicle by then, before it's really dialed in to, to where it should be. So the, the problem is, now you've welded the vehicle back together, half your welds are too cold, they didn't penetrate enough, maybe the other half you, you've got too hot, you, you've weakened the metal because you've applied too much heat into it, whereas if they would actually take the time to, to take that material that they're cutting off the vehicle anyways in the old panel, set up and test those welds, they make the adjustment that way when they go onto the vehicle and they start welding, they're, they're actually where they need to be so every weld on that car is as proper a, as it should be. Well, I think that's part of the issue that we see with technicians is the time. You know, are they are they taking the time to do test welds? Are they, you know, doing that takes time. You know, and and technicians are usually compensated for for that time as well. So if if they're not being compensated to to set the machine up and do the welds, they absolutely should be doing the setup and the test welds. But it may get overlooked if, if, they're, if they're not making sure that they're getting time that, that's adequately going to uh, 
let them perform the, the test welds and set up. Well, and it, interestingly enough, um, CCC just updated their, their, their guide to estimating a, a couple months back. One of their new additions to that guide was the fact that setting up and testing the welder is not included in any other base labor time and that it needs to be done based on equipment manufacturer or vehicle manufacturer requirements and it needs to be evaluated for on the spot on every job because again sometimes you may spend 10, 15, 20 minutes setting up and, and testing a welder based on a, a type of steel you're, you're welding or maybe on an aluminum vehicle you could spend an hour, hour and a half getting that welder dialed in where your penetration and, and everything is the way it needs to be. So you know to Andy's point it's important that, that the shop owner, the, the estimator, they understand it, it, it is an operation that's not included. It is something that you, you can get compensated for. And now it's in the guide for you to go back to that guide and, and look at and say, you know, it's very clearly not included. And, and you know, we're going to determine what it takes to do it based upon each job and how much time we actually spend doing it. If you have any more questions about this topic or you're looking for more information on others, please visit the Society of Collision Repair Specialists website. You can find us on the web at www.scrs.com.